This program is made possible in part by the Ohio Humanities Council under a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. The housing professionals know it as resegregation. The public knows it simply as white flight. It has a past, a present, and unfortunately, a future. No matter the region of the country in which it occurs, the symptoms are identical and the results are inescapable. A black family moves into an all-white enclave and the process is set in motion. There is the threat, or in many cases, the realization of violence. Lawns become infested with for sale signs as white families begin to leave the neighborhood in an epidemic of panic selling. Real estate brokers begin the practice of racial steering, showing the available homes to only black buyers while warning white buyers away. Property values decline and soon the neighborhood is once again segregated, except this time it is all black. But in one city, an unusual alliance of concerned residents, government officials, and real estate brokers have been fighting for almost 30 years to break this inevitable pattern, and in so doing have managed to change a number of the prevailing myths that have plagued open housing from the beginning. should be dilapidated by now. Their lawns litter strewn mudlots. Every other car should be up on blocks, and every face should be black. All of these things should be true if everything said about an integrated neighborhood is to be believed. But this is an integrated neighborhood, and none of these things is true or is about to become true. This is Shaker Heights, Ohio, one of Cleveland's oldest suburbs, and it is today much like it was when it began in 1920 a middle class to upper middle class to wealthy bedroom community of about 35,000 people. 25% of the residents of Shaker Heights are black. Now, if this sounds unique to you, then it is in keeping with Shaker Heights history, which has been unique from the beginning. Shaker Heights derives its name from a religious sect whose members, when in a trance, would shake. Those outside the sect who observed this ritual derisively dubbed them Shakers. They founded the North Union Colony on land donated to them by a farmer named Ralph Russell. A wealthy communal sect, they believed in total abstinence from sex to such an extent that men and women were even buried in separate halves of the cemetery. They relied on converts and the adoption of orphans to replenish their ranks. As a result of their celibacy, however, there were only 27 members left in the Valley of God's Pleasure in 1890. The sect sold their land here, and their leader, Eldris Kleiman Minor, led them to an existing Shaker community in Lebanon, Ohio. It is an ironic footnote that the Shakers, in a time of racial bigotry and intolerance, believed in the doctrine of racial equality. The land was eventually bought by two brothers, Oris Paxton and Mantis James Van Swearingen, in 1905. Influenced by the ideas of British social reformer Ebenezer Howard, who criticized the haphazard evolution of sprawling suburbs, the Van Swearingen's planned Shaker Village from the largest down to the smallest detail. The lots and streets were laid out with respect to the topography of the land, and the houses were designed by the foremost architects of the day in accordance with the guidelines set forth in the Van Swearingen's pamphlet entitled Shaker Village Standards. The population of the village began to increase once the brothers acquired the Nickel Plate Railroad Line and extended the tracks into Shaker, providing high-speed commuter service to and from downtown Cleveland. However, progressive social ideas were not in the Van Swearingen's plan for Shaker Heights. The brothers felt that people would move into the community only if they knew it was reserved for the right people. People who would share their social outlook, people who would share their social values. And the negative side of that, of course, was the understanding that certain so-called undesirable elements, not named, but assumed to be Jewish, Italian, Roman Catholic, black, 
would not be living in their neighborhoods. My research has turned up uh, three incidents between 1924 and 1925, interestingly involving black buyers in the community. The first of these involved the sale of a large farm by an individual named Percy Hills, located in an area that's not part of Shaker Heights today. It was out at the intersection of what would now be Richmond Road and Chagrin, Chagrin at that time being called Kinsman Road. And an agent of the Van Swearingen Company named John Hecker sold 302 lots from the Percy Hills farm to black buyers. And Otis Van Swearingen apparently had some second thoughts about this and decided that it could not be and instructed his agent to buy back the lots from these black purchasers before properties, before homes were built on them. And the company then proceeded to buy back those lots at prices of about $5,000, $6,000 per lot, which was an incredibly high price in those days. The company bought them back at approximately 10 times what the buyers had paid for them and took a loss of about $750,000. That was the first of a pattern whereby the company bought out undesirables. A second incident, less well known, involved buying out a black undertaker for $10,000. The third incident um, is interesting because it suggests the first real harassment of blacks in this community. And that was an incident on Huntington Road involving a black doctor who had bought a home on Huntington Road in 1925. And again, it was Otis Van Swearingen who decided that this could not be. And he was still, uh, I think, probably licking his wounds from the losses the company had taken. And so tried other methods to persuade this gentleman to sell out. One incident involved some rock throwing by some boys on the street. And apparently that night, the doctor's chauffeur came out of the house and fired a gun in the air to scare them away, I suppose. The police were called in. The police then stationed a 24-hour patrol outside the doctor's home. Everybody going in and coming out was searched. And that kind of pressure had its desired result. He was persuaded to sell. That was in 1925. And in 1927, you then find the first formal restrictive covenants being written into the property deeds in Shaker Heights. Shaker eventually gained a sizable Catholic, Jewish, and ethnic population, although at the end of the 50s, the numbers of blacks living here was negligible. As the white neighborhoods of Cleveland that surrounded Shaker began to undergo racial change, the suburb began receiving its first black families. They came to Ludlow, an area that straddled both Cleveland and Shaker, but was entirely within the Shaker Heights school system. I have four children, and uh, the schools, of course, were very important to us. I wanted them to um, not only get the benefits of a good education, but also be in school with people with whom they would go to college, hopefully, and uh, with whom they would compete uh, after they finished school. I thought it was very important that they learn not only the school lessons, but the lessons of life. We moved there primarily because our children were just about ready to go to school, and we wanted to live in an area that had a very good school system. And we, we already knew about the Shaker schools, and though it was the, not in Shaker Heights, it was the Shaker Heights City School Districts, and this was, this was our primary motive in moving into the Ludlow District. Why did the first black families who moved into Shaker choose Ludlow when the less affluent, blue-colored Moreland district would seem to be a more likely entry point? Like Ludlow, it bordered Cleveland and would also have given their children access to the Shaker school system. The obvious answer is that they could afford a more expensive style of housing than what Moreland had to offer. The homes in Moreland were similar in size and architecture to the houses they had left behind in Cleveland. They were moving up, not laterally. 
The less obvious answer is that because of the more affluent and better educated residents of Ludlow, these pioneer black families thought their presence would be more accepted. We recognized that there would be uh, potential risks. Um, at that time, there had been a bombing of a family in Shaker. Uh, we knew these were possibilities. Uh, I did buy a big dog certainly shortly after we moved, and uh, I thought this would offer me some protection, or at least alert me if anything uh, was about to happen. But we found the reception was very pleasant. Uh, it was not nearly what we expected. I think there are a few cooks in this world that would do things, but for the most part, uh, people accepted me for, for a person that I am, and uh, uh, I think uh, I proved to be an asset to the community. A lot of racism is very subtle. I think there's been a great degree of acceptance in terms of people of other nationalities, other races, and religions. However, when it comes to someone moving next door, I think that's when really the feelings begin to, uh, to erupt. It was only after we had been there for some time that we began to to interact with our neighbors and discover that there were those of us who had a great deal in common. The area real estate brokers at first tried to block the entrance of blacks into the all-white enclave. Finding a house in Shaker in the 50s was a, was a difficult uh, task. You could not just go to a realtor and uh, say, I'd like to look at houses in Shaker. You had to um, uh, do different things to find houses. A black family coming into a real estate office would have been shown very, very few listings and very, very few houses in extremely limited neighborhoods. And there would have been no bones about the fact that that was the right thing for the realtor to do. This was perfectly comfortable for everybody. Nobody expected it to be any different. You either had to know someone that was selling a house or you had to uh, really dig up the house yourself just about to find it. And even then, there was no guarantee that you could buy it. The seller might not want to sell it to you. The banks probably wouldn't want to loan you the money to buy the house. So you had to really overcome a lot of obstacles to, to find a house. When we purchased the lot, for some reason, um, it did not have the stipulations that were generally in the deeds uh, to houses uh, in, in, in Shaker Heights and in the Shaker Heights City School District. Uh, this was a quirk and of course which meant simply that we did not have to get the signatures of 10 people across the street and so many people on the left and so many people on the right and this was unusual when the first black families moved in um, immediately the real the real estate community said to themselves well obviously no white families would ever want to live here and immediately took all of their white families out of those neighborhoods. Blacks, finding the area accessible and the atmosphere non-hostile, began to move in at a rate that would have made Ludlow 84% black in 10 years. But this did not happen. Not wanting to see their community go the way of so many others, the residents banded together and formed the Ludlow Community Association. Obviously, there was a lot of concern about property values and certainly certain unscrupulous realtors did a lot to uh, fan the fears that people had that property values were going to decline as a result of blacks moving in. And that had been a pattern in many American cities uh, that, that people read about. So all these fears were being fanned by uh, a lot of hate literature as well as realtors going door to door and saying you better sell today because tomorrow they'll be here. And it was because of this that we began just to sit down and talk about what we could do about it. And this was really the birth of the, the Ludlow Housing Office. Members of this community met one-on-one -on -one with realtors and said, look, you've got to stop doing this. And that if you're not going to show families homes in this community, we are going to do that. And so we, we'd like to help you do your business. But if you're not going to show families homes in our community, we're going to take that responsibility. We actually became the real estate agent for our community. We showed houses. We bought buyer and seller together. So I still feel that, this, that we were pioneers, that the Ludlow Community Association was pioneers in the whole area of housing in Shaker Heights. The success of the association made Ludlow a nationally recognized model of an integrated community. Blacks gradually began to move into the three other communities south of the Shaker Rapid Tracks, Moreland, Lomond, and Sussex. These areas, following Ludlow's example, formed their own associations and attempted to stabilize their respective neighborhoods. 
In 1966, the four community associations signed an agreement with 16 area real estate brokers to show white prospects available homes in integrated areas. Community attitudes about um, exclusion of minorities probably have much less impact on the real estate community today than they did immediately after the Fair Housing Act of 1968. I think realtors today, no matter how naive or prejudiced as individuals, feel they have the establishment behind them in, in their need to obey the law, from local legislation all the way to FBI enforcement so that local community attitudes, the fear that they will never get a listing there again, the fear that their office will be bombed, I think these things are archaic, they're really of the past. People are much more uh, cognizant of the fact that they have to obey the law than afraid of community reaction to bringing in a minority family. Approximately 10 or 12 years ago, a prominent realtor who lives and works in Shaker Heights, but is active throughout the entire community, did a comparative study between two suburbs, Shaker Heights on the east side, already significantly integrated, and Rocky River on our west side, an all-white ghetto. The houses are, the, the communities are very similar in that they have equal access to the Cleveland Rapid, which gives them easy access to downtown, and that they have housing stock of equal age that sell for approximately within the same price range. His study showed that Rocky River as an all-white community with the same appeal and the same services that Shaker Heights has had appreciated at a slower rate than Shaker Heights values did. In 1967, the four community associations were merged into the Shaker Heights Housing Office. Financial support and supervision was provided by the City Council and the Board of Education, and the office was mandated to find white buyers for the Ludlow, Moreland, Lomond, and Sussex areas. The primary goal then, and I think it still is to a great extent, is to see that there are, is white movement in Shaker Heights. Because historically what had happened all over the country is that as uh, communities became integrated, it went from white to integrated to black, and our goal was to see that it remained an integrated community. And we could only do that by seeing that white families continued to move in. When the housing office was formed, many of us involved in the Lomond Association and that sort of thing thought, well, if we can hang on for three or four years as an integrated community, we'll do well. In other words, we. We contemplated the possibility of the community really flip-flopping. And here we are, 20 years later, or almost, and it's still thriving. Today, the primary concern of the housing office remains integration maintenance. This involves attracting and aiding white home seekers who are interested in housing in mainly integrated areas. And the reciprocal is true, aiding blacks to find housing in mainly white areas. Whites and blacks who are not interested in this pro-integrative policy can seek their own options without help or hindrance from the housing office. Integration maintenance involves taking race into account in order to uh, provide a countervailing influence to the segregative influences in the larger society. What we're talking about is attracting whites to where whites are underrepresented in the housing traffic and blacks to areas where blacks are underrepresented in the housing traffic. The goals of the Shaker of the Shake Heights Housing Office to maintain a viably integrated uh, community is certainly a worthy one. I think those who are not in sympathy with the approach find that integration management and maintenance somehow works to the disadvantage of uh, the minority, se minority seeker. In my work as a realtor, I have met people who have attempted to buy housing in Shaker but could not access the total inventory. And in this particular instance, this means that the individual was being denied. Now, although it's for a worthy social goal, it is still the individual's right by law to be able to have access to the total marketplace. So in that sense, any time an individual is denied, uh, there's an inequity there that just cannot be justified. We don't stop people from making segregative moves. We'll only give them assistance, uh, full assistance, if they're willing to explore their integrative moves. But we don't uh, abridge their options. 
we uh, seek to influence people so as to uh, look at options that they wouldn't have looked at, housing options, schooling options. This doesn't take from anybody a right. What this does is make sense out of integration, or make sense out of fair housing, that is. Fair housing doesn't make sense unless we're talking about a, a free, informed choice. If the choice is limited to traditional options, uh, and if what it means is basically extending the boundaries of the ghetto, uh, then it doesn't have any real meaning in terms of the housing market. The fact is, at one time, there were housing opportunities that were being denied because they were not listed with real estate people. So that an individual that comes in that market and were to come to my office or any other office would not have access to that particular listing, whereas their white counterpart would have knowledge of that listing through uh, the Shaker Housing Office. Now, at this point, I'm not sure whether the program is being operated just as it was when it initially was structured, but that was a problem that I saw at that time. It's true that we don't show uh, houses to black people in areas of the community where uh, white people are underrepresented. It's also true that we don't show houses to whites in areas of town where black people are underrepresented. That's an equal and even-handed program. People are free on their own to find housing in those areas. Uh, we don't restrict that, and we would uh, fight for their right to, to make those segregative choices uh, if it were being infringed upon. But there is no justification for spending taxpayers' money, money raised from the taxpayers of the city of Shaker Heights, from the Shaker Heights City School District, to help people explore segregative housing options. That just wouldn't make any sense. Integration is a process. It's a process where both blacks and whites can go into the market at any time and find housing without constraints. And that will only come about when the total marketplace is open. Whether one agrees or disagrees with the policy of integration maintenance, it has been successful to an extent in Shaker Heights, with the one exception being the Moreland District. This area has traditionally been populated by the lowest economic group in the city. Blacks saw in Moreland an opportunity to reap the benefits of Shaker's superb educational system at the price of an affordable home. The Shaker school system is considered to be one of the finest in the country. Year after year, Shaker has been a leader in the number of merit scholarship finalists. However, the inability of the housing office to attract whites with school-aged children to the Moreland neighborhood resulted in a racially identifiable school. In 1970, Moreland school was 88% black. The parents, who had sacrificed to place their children into the Shaker school system and the school board, both looked upon this situation with alarm. The Shaker school's plan was implemented. The Shaker School's plan means that if you are black and you live in uh, Lomond, Ludlow, or Moreland, that you may volunteer to transfer to the six other elementary schools with predominantly white populations. And it also means the same thing in reverse. If you are white and you live in the six elementary schools with predominantly uh, white populations, and that would be Boulevard, Fernway, uh, on a way, Sussex, Mercer, and Malvern, and you could volunteer to bus to either Ludlow, Moreland, or um, Loman. We have also added uh, the uh, ma magnet-type programs to uh, both all three of those schools. Uh, Ludlow has the gifted and talented program, and also a program that we call Literary Projects. Moreland has the uh, computers and also is the gifted math program and the science and French are at Lomond. Um, we feel that these programs have been very successful. Uh, we are at uh, the point now where we, f we need to look, and look at the programs and evaluate them for the future. The program raised Moreland schools white enrollment from 12 to 35 percent. However, the success of the Shaker School's plan did not trigger a corresponding success in relation to the neighborhood's housing trend. The black population continued to grow as the white population diminished. This fact, coupled with the conversion of nearby Ludlow to a magnet school, drawing white students to it from Moreland, has driven Moreland's white enrollment down to 21%. But had nothing been attempted, the black enrollment of the school would have been 95% virtual segregation. 
I think that we have to reawaken in people the, the kind of interest that we had in the program when it first started. And that, that people have to learn that, that this is an experiment that provides a, an opportunity for their children to, to participate in a real democracy. The Shaker School Board, administrators, and many of the teachers, parents, and the students are dedicated to a totally integrated school system. There has been and probably always will be differences on how to achieve integration, but they all realize the importance of such a system, especially the students. of integration in Shaker Heights. Will it become an historical footnote as a social experiment that failed, like the experiment of the Shaker sect that first settled the land? Or will it be considered the model for all communities of the 21st century? There are no sure answers, but there are opinions. The country uh, has to deal with racism, and racism is here in Shaker as well. I think that there might have been a silver lining in the fact that some people who may have thought that racism was behind us, that we don't have to deal with, us, with it, that we've turned the corner, are now aware that it is something to deal with. We deal with it on an everyday basis here at the housing office. Uh, our sales coordinators, our rental coordinators, uh, our prospecting people, our marketing people are always running into folks who are taking race into account in a negative way, in a way that promotes segregation. There's no surprise to us that, uh, that racism is a reality in Shaker Heights. I think the most important thing, however, when we're talking about integration maintenance, is finding out what is at root of the fear that many white residents have in living in predominantly black areas or even in mixed areas. You have to get to those fears and address them and let those, and quite frankly, alleviate the fears by letting people know that to live in an integrated environment is a positive. It's very beneficial. It's good for the community. It's good for your own personal growth. And I think when something like this is, is demonstrated to those white prospective homeowners, that they will be more than willing to live in areas that now are predominantly black or are, are quite well mixed. The program of integration at Shaker Heights is a program that, that still uh, needs uh, tremendous efforts. The, the, uh, the program uh, is, is not complete. We can't sit back and relax. Uh, racial prejudices still do exist. Uh, we must continue to make sure that there is an adequate flow of uh, white families into the integrated areas to maintain a stable, racially balanced community and to make sure that black families can, can find adequate housing wherever they want to live in white communities as well as integrated and segregated communities. So that the effort must be maintained um, for the unforeseeable future. But I'm satisfied that with the kind of efforts that Shaker Heights and now some of its uh, uh, cooperating communities around it are engaged in, that the effort will be successful. Whites have been very attracted to Shaker Heights for a long time and they have continued during the period that Shaker Heights has been integrated, which goes back a quarter of a century now. I think they continue to move in, and I think they will continue to move in in sizable numbers. Shaker simply has too much to offer as an outstanding suburban residential community. I mean, we've got a plain community with excellent housing stock. We've got uh, uh, extraordinarily good city services. We've got schools that have been outstanding for years and years. We've got some great recreational facilities and good transportation. There's just too much here in Shaker Heights for people to turn their back on. They will continue to be attracted to Shaker Heights. Integration has been cynically defined as the brief span of time between the first black family moving in and the last white family moving out. Shaker Heights, Ohio has been redefining the definition for 27 years. Some view it as an experiment. The residents of Shaker consider it a way of life. And it truly couldn't happen to a nicer place.
This program has been made possible in part by the Ohio Humanities Council under a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Let us show you Shaker Heights. The staff of the Shaker Housing Office would be pleased to give you a personal tour of schools, parks, homes, and to introduce you to Shaker residents. Whether you are considering a move or in a position to influence others who are moving to the Cleveland area, please call. Our staff will describe all aspects of Shaker life and provide accurate answers to your questions. For your personalized view of Shaker Heights, call 751-2155.